welcome to today's lecture on the effects digitalization has on the way we do science. So digitalization affects many aspects of our modern life. It changes the way business works, it revolutionizes governmental administration, it modernizes democracy. And among these, one of the aspects I am very excited about it personally, it also changes the way we do science. That's not surprising because science is a process that is almost completely based on information and communication. So digitalization of information and communication surely changes the way we do science. And you know that yourself, if you do research, if you research for a ticket online or, or for a book to read or for a song or for some kind of other assignment, digitalization surely completely changes it, changes the process compared to how it was only a few years ago. So that's what we will talk about today. In specific, we will ask how does digitalization help us to understand society because we do social science here. So that's the focus, uh, what, what we will zoom in on. The scientific method is based on two equally important lags, an empirical lag and a theoretical lag. Empirical means that we observe the world as it is, we collect data about the world, we then analyze this data, these observations in order to obtain some more fundamental truth about how it might work. The official name for this process is called induction, inductive reasoning. And the other way around, if we start with the theoretical side of things, what we do there is we, without any explicit or obvious use of data, because we always have some observations in mind, but we usually start from first principles, from axioms, and from these axioms we derive how it should and must work. So they are more like logical conclusions. For example, so I have the example of one very famous scientist, Charles Darwin. He started with the empirical sides of things. So for five years from 1831 to 1836, he, he was traveling around the world, especially in Latin America, on a ship, the famous Beagle, where, for example, he stopped in Galapagos Islands and he observed finches. And he started to understand that finches on one island had longer peaks than on the other island. So he's, he asked, like, why could that be? Why do finches in one island have longer peaks than on the other? And, and he collected a, a vast, impressive amount of empirical observation of data. Then it, nothing really happened a lot for the general public for 30 years. He was thinking about these conclusions. He, he thought, maybe I'm wrong. Are, are these peaks really longer because the finches adapted to the environment and these different? How could that work? How does evolution work? How do finches adapt over time? and he developed his theory of natural selection. And it was not until 30 years later that he dared to also really publish the origin of species, and not until much later, until 40 years later, uh, the descent of man, uh, where he then had a theoretical explanation derived from this empirical data. So it's, it's a classical a process of induction. It has induced it from the data, his theory of natural selection. Another example, the other way around, is this guy here, uh, Albert Einstein. He was not necessarily very much interested in making observations. He was not an em empiricist. He was a theorist. Back in these days, 1900, early 1900, turn of the century, uh, it, there was a big hypothesis that the speed of light is constant. So the speed of light is speed with which light travels. It's also the fastest speed with which information can travel in our universe. And Einstein said, so if you guys are really serious with that claim that the speed of light is constant and speed is, for example, miles per hour, then we have miles that has something to do with space and hour that has something to do with time. And if you say that is constant, then something must, must happen to space and time. So he just took this existing claim and he just rode it through like on a train. He didn't take hostages. He just said, well, if you guys are serious with that, then this must follow, this must follow, this must follow. Space and time must curve. Time must actually be another dimension of space, nothing else. Time is the fourth dimension of a three-dimensional space that we have here and so forth and so forth. But this was just really deduction. He deduced it from some first principles from this, from this claim. And it was not like Einstein published his theory of relativity in 1905 or 1915, then the general theory, and he was instantly world famous. 
No, people ridiculed him. People said, well, what a crazy idea. That, that does not necessarily have something to do with reality. The math is pretty, but with reality. And then it was not until later, until 1919, that empiricists made tests in West Africa and in Brazil and Latin America. They observed the position of the stars as they passed by close by the sun. And they showed that Einstein's theory of relativity must be correct. Only then he immediately became world famous. But before it was just a theoretical construct. And that's the difference between arts and sciences. So arts might as well be fiction. Theoretical work often is very similar to fiction. It's a very creative work. Sometimes we come up just with hypothesis. And if you look at some philosophical works or work in the humanities, it is often very difficult to distinguish. Is this now, what is this aiming at? Is this just fiction, poetry? Is it art? Or is it really aiming at trying to explain reality? Now it only becomes science once we also test it, once we test this theory empirically. And Einstein himself, he made suggestions on how to test it. So he was a real scientist. He was not only saying, well, I might imagine this is a beautiful thing. No, he said, well, this is my theory and tested these three ways. If any of them fails, the theory must be completely wrong. Forget about my theory and forget about me. It's, it's, it's completely wrong. So he also shaped his theory in order so it could be tested. That's how he explained his theory. So science always has these two legs. It has a theoretical leg where we think about how things might work. We derive them from first principles, often deduction or abduction. We have then hypothesis uh, very often in the social sciences, and then we test them empirically. So that's the empirical work. In some uh, elder sciences, or the elder science maybe physics, there's also a clear division of work. So they're the theoretical uh, physicists and empirical physicists, and they don't often get along and they're big discussions. If, you know the sitcom Big Bang Theory. There's uh, there's Leonard Hofstadter and Sheldon Cooper, and th that's how it kind of like works. So these are two different legs of science, but one completely depends on the other, um, and that's uh, what we will now talk about: how digitalization affects both the empirical and the theoretical leg of science. The big revolution of digitalization with regards to empirical work often goes under the catchphrase big data. So there is a digital footprint about in social science, about social interactions. And this is often referred to as big data. We analyze this digital footprint and we can analyze what happened in the past because people acted a certain way. We have their footprint and we can analyze what, what happened in this past and from that derive theory models and so forth. Now the theoretical work is also very much impacted by digitalization uh, through so computer simulations. Because, and that is very important in the social sciences, especially because social sciences are notoriously not, not stationary. What do I mean by that? For example, in physics, the sun has been rising for the last several million years here on planet Earth, and it was rising 200 years ago, and we're pretty sure that it will rise again tomorrow. So studying what happened 200 years ago gives us some very likely insight what will happen tomorrow because it's a stationary process. In the social sciences, if you study society how it was 200 years ago, it might not necessarily tell you how society will act tomorrow just because 200 years ago society looked very different. So there is an inherent non-stationarity in social processes. But computer simulations, theoretical work, can help us to think about what might happen tomorrow in theory. We don't have the data because tomorrow never happened. But in theory, we can deduce specific future theoretical scenarios from computer simulations. So that's what, what we use them for. Sometimes I call big data, uh, the empirical forecasting of history, the digital crystal ball, because it's kind of like deterministically tells us this, how the future will happen under the assumption that it is very similar to past history. And computer simulations, theoretical work, the digital magic wand, because it allows us to explore scenarios that never happen. And we can change the course of history just by swinging our magic wand. So uh, that's how you can think about these two legs. Now, in the intersection 
between the empirical and the theoretical lag of the scientific method, that's where the holy grail is. Uh, that's where we ask, well, why happened what happened? And um, all the sciences try to actually at the end go to that, to that question. And at the end of this lecture, I will come back to you with a very disappointing news. Now, please sit down. I have to tell you that there are really severe limitations to the scientific method and that unfortunately I will explain to you why we will never be able to really find out why things happen, why what happens. So there are severe limitations to it and we will get back to that disappointing news at the end of the lecture.